Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. I've got a really interesting uh, individual to introduce you to today. Alex Johnston is her name. She's the chief, chief executive officer at an organization called 360 Concussion Care, Inc. Uh, so we're going to be obviously talking about uh, concussion and uh, and some issues there, which I'm, I'm uh, well aware of, and, and I'm thinking it's going to be an interesting conversation. But in addition... She wrote a book that uh, has gotten uh, top uh, billing at uh, Indigo and Chapters on um, on an eye altering, a life altering, eye opening journey from infertility to motherhood. So that sounds interesting as well. Alex, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Very well, thank you. So let's start out with uh, concussion, and maybe we can come back to the book uh, in a in a bit. Um, you, uh, I understand, uh, are a seasoned business executive. You got more than two decades of leadership experience in public and private sectors, and you uh, uh, describe yourself as a passionate champion for nurturing and growing Canadian excellence. You lead this team at uh, 360 Concussion Care with uh, leaders and experts in the concussion community. What are you trying to do? Oh, I love that question. Uh... So we got into this because my brother-in-law, who's American but moved uh, 20 years ago to Canada um, when he married my sister uh, and are based out of Ottawa, he led the largest pediatric concussion study in the world about six or seven years ago, which fundamentally changed care for kids. No more dark rooms, no screens, don't let them do anything until they feel better. It was like, get them in, get them back, make sure they're connecting to their life. Um, And since then, he's done tons of sort of, you know, additional research projects. Um, I said to him about three and a half years ago, Raj, you're doing world leading research. Nobody I know can get good care. Um, And anyone I knew with, you know, money was going down to the US and coming back with what felt like pretty straightforward advice, which was good advice. But I said, I don't understand why people I care about are not able to get good care here, um, Toronto, Ottawa, et cetera. So we ended up saying, if we were to try to solve this problem, what would it look like? And we built a care model. Uh, multidisciplinary, so physician-led, but um, allied health professionals working with them to get people really specifically what they need early on and get them in and out as quickly and safely as possible. So not belabor it for eight weeks, 12 weeks, we're on the wrong path, and then realize they're getting terrible advice. And that was interesting to us. But what got us really excited is we realized if we started from scratch, we could build systems that made it a learning health system. So we're constantly capturing data and we're able to produce the kind of research that he produced, which was a two and a half million dollar study for a fraction of that cost, but high quality research. And we're sharing that with uh, the public system. We're sharing that with doctors, with physicians, with physiotherapists, with health leaders. Um, bringing those two things together for us felt very transformational. I love uh, I love working on things like that. I worked in government for a long time. And I love the experience, but healthcare costs were going up when I started at 8% a year, which is not sustainable. Yep. Um, and we need models that are going to deliver high quality healthcare. I believe in public healthcare. It can't be the sole solution for all of our problems. And so integrating a model like ours, that's producing, um, you know, a, a successful private enterprise with a significant public component that's bringing good to the public system for me is a win-win. Uh, we've got our flagship prototype in Ottawa, Opened September 2020. We opened Midtown Toronto September 2021, and we opened in Mississauga October uh, 2022. And we're building a model that we could put anywhere uh, in the country in North America. And part of the objective is the care piece, but part of the objective is to build the biggest research uh, platform in the world for concussion patients um, and really produce game-changing research. Fantastic. Uh, we're going to come back to that in greater detail. Uh, in a couple of minutes, but maybe let's jump uh, to the book. Tell me about uh, the book, please. What's it called? Uh, it's called Inconceivable, My uh, Life-Altering, Eye-Opening Journey from Infertility to Motherhood. So at the same time that I made a decision that I wanted to try to start a business and build something from the ground up, um, I made a decision that I wanted to take the time to write about my husband's and my experience building our family, which was quite challenging. Um, the intersection with both is really the health piece, uh, uh, working in government, you know, I care about health and I really did see the unsustainable pressure on, on healthcare and health costs. Um, and I was talking anecdotally with many people since my husband and I uh, had a lot of difficulty building our family about infertility. We ended up using, um, working with surrogates for three of our four children Uh, And that was very unusual at the time in sort of the mid to late 2000s. And so anyone who had anyone uh, they knew with fertility issues or looking at surrogacy would direct them to me. So every year we talked to 20 or 30 strangers about 
um, our journey and try to provide helpful information that would be useful for them in their decision making. I wanted to take that further and actually create something that had greater impact. And I worked very hard in government um, on changing infertility policy. Um, and I think there's been some good steps there. In sharing the story, it was really, you know, saying this was our experience. Uh, we started trying to have a family when I was 32. It never crossed my mind I would have issues. I looked at my mom who had five kids in seven years. I'm like, this this can't be, um, you know, a problem for, for me. And it was. Um, and the main point in writing the book is I do not want women to go into this significant, um, you know, part of their life uninformed. Um, and I really want them to know as much as they need to know about their own bodies, about infertility. Um, and then the broad, you know, the broader purpose of the book is sort of impact on companies, governments really thinking about this issue differently and, and seeing a role for them and making it more accessible for people to get help if they need help building their families. What a fascinating, uh, you know, two very different but uh, very interesting uh, experiences and and uh, and outputs. Uh, a book and and a and a not for profit that's uh, trying to really uh, revolutionize concussion care. This is going to be a fascinating conversation. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. <laughs> We're going to take a break for some messages and be back in just two minutes. Uh, with Alex, and it's going to be an interesting conversation today. We're going to delve into concussion, what causes it, and and how uh, care has dramatically changed, and uh, and what uh, uh, her organization is trying to do. And then we're also going to, uh, I think, talk a little bit about infertility and uh, and what a fascinating book. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Krabby Radio. While we're on Saga 960, our guest tonight is Alex Johnston. She is the Chief Executive Officer at 360 Concussion Care, Inc. Uh, we're going to be chatting a lot about concussion, uh, but she's also a published author about a book uh, in uh, uh, that, that's about infertility and her journey uh, from infertility to motherhood. And so I think that's going to be interesting. Uh, she uh, describes herself as a uh, relentless advocate for greater awareness and understanding of infertility and health policy reforms that support inclusive family building. Sounds interesting. She's got just an unbelievably interesting background. Uh, she uh, has been vice chair of the board of directors and member of the executive committee for Desjardins uh, General Insurance uh, Group. Uh, as I mentioned, she's the CEO of 360 Concussion. Uh, previously, she was the vice president of strategy and public affairs at CBC Radio. So that might be an interesting topic uh, we could talk about. She was the chief executive. Sorry, no, she was the executive director of uh uh, for Canada, for Catalyst Inc., and I'm familiar with Catalyst Inc., and, and so I'd like to chat maybe a little bit about that. She was the Executive Director of Policy and the Senior Policy Advisor for Justice, Social, and Women's Policy in the Office of the Premier for the Government of Ontario. So another unbelievably interesting uh, background. And before all that, she was a lawyer, and she uh, worked uh, at uh, Goodman's. Uh, she's got a, a, a an exceptional background uh, from an educational standpoint. She's got a law degree from McGill University. I thought this was really interesting. She uh, took Mandarin in uh, Beijing at the Beijing Language and Culture University, and she's got a BA at McGill University. So really quite a fascinating background. That's something else, isn't it? <laughs> It's uh, it was it was quite a journey, Brian. You made me sound much more interesting than I am. I think this is pretty interesting. Uh, you know, uh, let me just jump to it just for a second. What was it like working for eight years in the premier's office? It was amazing. I I would you would you could not pay me enough to go back into government. It's uh it's a complex uh it's a complex place, and I think politics has gotten tougher and tougher. Um uh. But I, I learned so much. I mean, it really was, uh, it's a true service job. Watching people in action in government on the political side or the civil service side is really exceptional. It attracts very good people. I think the structure is really challenging. Um, and uh, I think there's more we can do with the talent in government. Uh, but changing that structure is hard. Uh, but it was, a, it was a real privilege. I have such respect for anyone who does that for um, part or all of their career. I learned a ton. Eight uh, years is a long time. And you know what? I was thinking the other day, I never put a picture up in my office. I never, like, there was nothing I ever did to decorate my office. And I kept thinking, it'll be a year, it'll be two years. Um, and then I kept thinking, maybe another year. And then it was eight years. But I I never felt like I was going to be there for a long time. It really was 
quite a journey uh, and working with a really great group of people. Um, I had a huge respect for, you know, the, the, the frontline people who are really putting their, their selves out there, uh, the politicians and a huge respect for the people who supported that work on the civil service side. Now Catalyst uh, Canada is a organization um, to uh, further females in uh, the workplace. Is that not correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your time there. Uh, so love that. After government, I took a year off because I had three kids in 15 months, uh, which is really what the book is about, uh, but preceded by six years of uh, terribleness. Um, and so I went to Catalyst and it felt like work that I was going to love working with uh, businesses um, to really help them understand barriers to women's advancement in the workplace. Uh, I thought it was a wonderful but small platform. And in the end, I had a board of 20 Canadian CEOs. My board chair was the CEO of BMO, Bill Down, unbelievable human being. Um, and those CEOs really extended the platform into their companies, through their companies to create much greater impact. Uh, the joy was both the work. Um, it's a special organization, but having the chance to work with you know, people of that caliber around the board table was exceptional. Uh, they really cared. Um, you can see the level of sophistication they bring to their work. Um, and the kind of talent they have to to lead sort of 50, 60,000 people organizations. Um, and that was amazing, seeing how much they cared, seeing how much they wanted to understand the barriers, you know, through real evidence, um, and then use strategies that weren't going to waste people's time, bring everyone along. So not make it, you know, this is you, you're doing this wrong, but, you know, there are things we have to do to be the strongest organization we can. Let's talk about what that looks like and then do the right things. Uh, it was amazing. It was a really career transformational experience um, and a lot of great mentors um, along the way. The reason I ended up on the digital insurance board, which I've loved, um, was the uh, CEO of Desjardins, um, the bank was on my board uh, and saw me in action and wanted me to both contribute and learn. So she put me on that board a number of years ago and it's been really also a great experience. Where do you think uh, women uh, are in this uh achievement of uh, of equality in, in the workplace? Uh, you know, it's funny. I always, when I talk about this, I never want to use the sort of boiler speaking points. Um, you know, we're making progress, but the reality is there's no question there's progress. I think there is a level of openness that is, um, that is very real. Uh, I think there are some exceptional people role modeling the best practices uh, in business. My point with this is more, you need the evidence. We would produce research through Catalyst and bring it to the board. And the starting point was always, that's shocking, but that can't be happening in my company. And things like we did a survey of 10,000 MBAs across the world coming out of their MBA program, looking at men and women and the first job offer they got, level of salary, level of position. Um, and consistently women were offered a salary that was lower and a position that was lower, despite having the same credential and similar backgrounds going into it. And so you quantify it and then you say, that's the starting point over 10, 20 years, that gap grows, the compensation gap grows, the promotion gap grows. And people's starting point would be like, that's shocking, but that can't be happening in our company. And then they look and they'd say, oh my gosh, that's happening in our company. So I do feel like that evidence piece is huge. People respond to evidence. Um, if you're just talking at them, if we're talking to people about a lot of things and they just have to tune out, if you give them a couple concrete pieces of information or evidence that they can actually look at, that to me is the really important precursor to change. Uh, and people are motivated when they know there's a problem to fix it. Everyone wants strong companies. Everyone wants every employee to be doing their best work. Um, if they know there are structural barriers that they need to address for that to happen, they're going to they're gonna take steps to do that. Gosh, we could do a show on each one of these topics, one on government and social justice issues and one on on uh, on Catalyst and uh, and women in the workforce. Uh, but we really want to talk about concussion. Um, and so let's switch to that if we could. So you're CEO of, of an organization that's uh, trying to uh, really revolutionize care. Concussion, I think, really is 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 one of those. Um, I don't know what you call it. it, it, it it's a health condition, I guess, uh, that has been. Uh, been sort of under researched and under described and and uh, and and uh, undertaken taken care of uh, over the course of uh, the last little while. I think that um, it's become more in the news for a couple of reasons. Uh, I think that uh, you know football and concussions on the football field are one. Um, uh, the movie with Will Smith uh, called uh, Concussion, I think, was really quite uh, impactful. And then I think everybody knows someone, if not themselves 
that have had a concussion. It, it's it's something that really is is very prevalent, and I think that uh, you know people have become far more aware of of the impact of concussion, and probably a lot of us have been a little bit surprised when we went into whoever it was the the physician or 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 a, or a, a therapist or something like that and 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 we're shocked with these new protocols that uh, instead of staying in a dark room for a whole long of time and not doing anything we're told to get back uh, back on the field uh, uh, right away so tell me what's happening with sort of care uh and and protocols for concussion right now so i think again there's uh good evidence and protocols. I think there's a breakdown in converting that broadly to care across the board. Um, we last summer, so the, the evidence is, 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 is there and there's a deeper and deeper pool of evidence. So my brother-in-law, uh, Dr. Roger Zemick and one of our other founders, Nick Reed, who's at U of T um, uh, as an academic there, lead the pediatric guidelines. So they lead 40 international uh, specialists who every six months review and make sure new evidence is incorporating into the pediatric guidelines. So anywhere in the world, Doctors, coaches, parents have a really good triage of is this a concussion uh, to be able to take the right next steps, even with that work. And it's funded by the Ministry of, of Health, uh, Ontario's Ministry of Health. Even with that exceptional work, last summer, uh, We360 said we're going to review school websites, sports websites to see what the guidance out there is. We were shocked at how um how uneven it was, how uh, misleading it was sometimes, how the misleading is just old and dated. Like sometimes it was evidence from four or five years ago. Um, so even though the guidelines are keeping up with the latest and greatest, converting that into practice um, is really hard. So we ended up doing, we took 40 pages of guidance from the pediatric guidelines, which we love, and we distilled into a really simple, actionable two-page information sheet. We put it on our website. We sent it out to as many doctors and ERs and physicians offices as possible. It's still hard to get a consistent approach. Um, awareness is sky high. Everyone knows now. Uh, people are nervous about you know people's health and liability and all those things. So as soon as someone's head is hit, there's a much different approach now to getting them out, getting them back in with the right steps. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, and so I think doing as much as possible to convert the evidence into clear, simple, straightforward, actionable guidance is really important. Um, it's a big focus of ours. It's a big focus of a number of the really good um, organizations like Parachute, but working together to make sure it's happening quickly and getting into protocols quickly. Every sports team, every school, every workplace, understanding what the next steps are, getting people early intervention. So don't wait for four, six, eight weeks until you're really derailing. If you have risks of prolonged recovery, um, get them in there early and make sure they're getting the right care right get, away. Get them where in early? And for, for proper care and proper care. And, you know, there's different, uh, there's different care out there. Part of why we did this is we felt the the quality was really uneven. Uh, and so for us, it's physician led. You got to have a trained specialized physician who specializes in concussion, doing a comprehensive assessment. They will make recommendations. The person will then meet with a rehab specialist to do you know, 45 minutes of rehab guidance. Here's where you are now. Here's for the next week or two, what you need to do to be back in school, back at work, back in your life um, and not stepping out of everything and then step-by-step step get them back to uh, where they need to be. Most concussions will heal within a certain period of time, maybe two to four weeks. If it's going on longer than that, you know, everybody needs to be doing the right things early on and getting that early guidance on that two-page information sheet for us is whether or not you seek care, doing the right things at home is really important. Uh, you need to know what those are. No, I understand. One of the big problems with concussion is actually diagnosing it. And uh, and there's this, what, 10-step uh, questionnaire program. So where where's diagnostics of concussion today? I think diagnostics is, is, uh, is in a pretty good place. I think there are consistent protocols. Um, you know, the, the big issue that you're trying to... Um, you know, assess for is something more significant. A concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. If it's more than a mild traumatic brain injury, a brain, a brain bleed, you know, a traumatic brain injury, you want to get that. And so anyone who really is experiencing symptoms um, should for sure get checked out by a physician and then make sure that they're in a place where they could get further testing if needed. Um, so I think the diagnosis is actually in pretty good shape. I think where it starts to break down is what happens after that. Um, and so where are you going? Uh, this big study, my uh, brother-in-law, uh, Roger led, uh, created a protocol called the 5P. It's like the indicators you're looking for out of the ER to um, flag uh, kids who are at risk for longer recovery. Uh, and so what we're 
in, in ERs, it's sort of embedded in their systems. You do the triage, you do the protocol, and then if someone's being red flagged on a number of indicators, refer them to the right care uh, right away so they don't end up sort of derailing on the recovery. But they That's interesting. Uh, any idea what those five Ps are? Uh, I don't know all of them, uh, but for sure, mental health is a component. Like if yep. someone has uh, anxiety, um, if someone has, uh, you know, learning issues that are going to make being out of school harder, um, it's really kind of scoring a number of different indicators. Uh, and so depending on what comes back, um, knowing when to refer on is a really important step for physicians. So I know that there have been um, some attempts at better diagnostics in regards to there. There's uh, saliva tests uh, that are under research. There's blood tests. There's uh, a pupil dilation uh, tests. Uh, but but you think that the current uh, sort of verbal uh, testing in the ERs is, is sufficient. Is that correct? Right now, it's for sure the best we have. Uh, we're really curious about some of the new um ways technology can influence that, but technology can influence it from a, you know, protocol and organizing information and having an app that does that technology can have an influence in, um, you know, having the right information and making sure people are getting properly trained and, and stuff through technology. So there are different ways we can use it. Um, we have not yet us uh, seen a diagnostic test that says, oh, if you do this, it's going to miraculously tell you there's a concussion. Um, that's not reality at this point. Uh, the, you know, the traditional 10 step process um, is still the best. You know, what, what most people rely on hundred percent. And so yeah. the world is changing and it might change under our feet. Um, but uh, you know, for us making sure that you're properly assessed by someone who knows what they're doing um, is really important. I think one of the biggest issues is, is getting people off of the, the field of play uh, when they've had a concussion, because from what I understand is one concussion is bad, but what is really bad is a concussion on top of a concussion when, uh, when you've already got one. Um, and it was explained to me once by a physician that uh, uh, successive concussions have a sort of a, uh, an incremental uh, linear uh, impact, but a concussion on top of a concussion has a logarithmic kind uh, of impact. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you're a football fan, but uh, the the game just, uh, you know, a week ago where the quarterback uh, fell down and uh, and his head hit and bounced. And then quickly uh, he was removed from the field of play and didn't come back um, because uh, whoever upstairs said this is bad and, uh, and we're not going to allow him to get hit again. So successive concussions are a real issue, are they not? Yeah, so we actually just had this conversation last week. We do a monthly lunch and learn with our team and we bring in like an amazing sort of global expert who's sort of generally a colleague of one of our founders. And so we just talked about um, the uh, the fact that after someone receives a concussion, I think the stat was they're 50% more likely to have a concussion in the next year or two. So what's going on that makes them more susceptible to concussion after their first one? Um, and then we were talking about whether there are things we can build into our care model to help inform people around preventative things they can do on the other side of the concussion. It is significant. Uh, I love a, how informed you are, Brian. Uh, Rowan's law in Ontario has changed things requiring sports clearance. So for people under 18, if they're hit and suspected to have a concussion, they have to be cleared to return to play. And that came about because, um, uh, you know, this wonderful, um, young woman uh, had a concussion uh, and then went back in um, uh, without healing properly uh, and in the first week or two uh, got a second concussion, which was devastating. Um, what we see is you've got a whole range of, we, we see anyone from two and to 100 years old, um, all mechanism of injury, so sport is part of that. But for sure with, um, with athletes and with teenagers, they want to play, they want to be with their teammates, they want to be um, back on the ice, they want to be back on the field. Um, and so we'll have parents come in and say, uh, totally ready for clearance. Uh, please, we've got to get a quick appointment. Like Saturday, there's a hockey tournament. Um, and so 100% feels great, has told me like no no symptoms, no nothing. We have a very, very strict protocol. We pop them on the exercise bike to do exercise threshold test testing to see how far they can push before they get symptomatic. And there's levels like one, two, three, four, five. Until you're at level five, you're not cleared. And we'll, we'll do that. We'll say, no, no. Like, you know, he or she's symptomatic at level three. Like, they can practice, but they can't play. They can't be in a situation where they're hit. They're not ready. Um, young people and people who want to be out there competing, playing, they want to get back as soon as possible. And so underreporting of symptoms is something we're uh, looking for to make sure that you are clearing in the right way. And for any 17-year-old who loves their 
hockey team or rugby team or whatever it is, um, they want to be with them. And so your responsibility as a healthcare professional is to make sure you get them out there as soon as possible, but in the safest way. And balancing those two things is is really important. That young lady you mentioned was playing rugby, I believe. And oh my God, what a sport to uh, get concussions. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think it is natural for a lot of uh, competitive athletes to want to get back on the field of play as quickly as possible, but it's the wrong decision. A hundred percent. And my daughter, uh, right after we opened that spring, she got a concussion in swimming um, and hit the, um, oh no, she got a concussion tobogganing. And then she went to swimming that night. Um, and I, as a parent, A, did all the wrong things. It was shocking to me how, how terrible it was as a parent, like chopped up in the car, um, didn't fully appreciate what was going on, wasn't there when she got hit. Um, and then that night realized something was going on. You know, she was out for two and a bit months. It was horrible. And she wanted to get back every day. Um, and then she'd make a little bit of progress and then backwards and a little bit of progress. You know, watching her chomping at the bit to get back to her teammates and competition, I get it. Um, but everybody needs to be really so well informed that you're doing the right things and you are getting people back as safely and quickly as possible. Employers care about this. It's not just athletes. Like everybody wants people to get back to where they need to be, to manage their life, to manage their work, to manage their school. Um, and if you do the right things, you're going to get better. Um, if you don't do the right things, the odds that you're going to start to, you know, have, have a prolonged recovery or not recover well are much higher. So, you know, take it to the extreme and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, we, we think about, you know, Eric Lindros or Muhammad Ali or, or, or football players in that movie, uh, a Concussion with Will Smith. Um, I, my understanding is that repeated concussions, particularly really tough repeated compassion, concussions, end up with a symptom almost like Alzheimer's. Is that correct? Brian, my uh, wonderful founders and colleagues joke that I'm the fake doctor, uh, but I will not answer that question because I do not know. Um, <laughs> I speak much of the language and I understand much of this, uh, but my role is very different from the physicians and I we just don't know. Uh, our One of our founders, John Letty out of Buffalo, worked with the Buffalo Bills um, and is really the person who developed the um, exercise testing protocol for for high performing athletes, uh, the, for professional athletes. It's now uh, generally used across the world for athletes. Um, John doesn't know, like we don't know exactly what's going on, and there's different evidence. And we had a lunch and learn on this about three months ago with John, um, but I just don't know. I mean, our focus right now is front end really good care, starting to build into that not just the right advice for that concussion, but advice going forward for other concussions. We have parents and people come in and saying, you know, it's been three, is that, is it time to call it a day? Um, and we'll say like, there's no magic number. There's no, you've got to look at how they're recovering. Is their recovery longer? Is what they're doing in the sport worth the risk of this happening again? There's no magic number, like it's three or it's seven. Like when do you stop? Individuals are different, but if you are getting it more frequently, you, you are getting them more frequently and you're becoming susceptible. And there seems to be evidence that once you have one, you become more susceptible. Um, those are the things you need to look at. But people will say, please just give me the right answer. And uh, stepping out of something you love doing is really hard. So when to do that and balancing those different interests is not an easy uh, discussion or an easy answer. And telling a 16-year-old they can no longer play something they played since they were eight and they love and they have friendships is a big decision. If people... Uh you know, are, are, are worried about uh, someone uh, having concussion um, and they want to access your services or your information, how how best to, can they do that? Uh, we are, the uh, website's probably best, uh, www.360concussioncare.com. Um, and uh, we've got the three locations now and we'll continue to expand and continue to build the research registry and um, and really keep trying to produce best possible evidence and share it as widely as possible. And these uh, clinics in uh, Toronto, Mississauga and uh, and Ottawa, what would one uh, receive if they go to those uh, clinics? Uh, so the initial assessment, you're meeting with a physician and you're meeting with a rehab specialist, either a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist to do sort of accommodation planning, um, or you're going in and they're saying, you're actually really good. You probably need another week of some modifications, but uh, you don't need to come back. Um, the physician part is covered by OHIP, so that's the public part of the model for us. And the rehab guidance is private pay, so you get WSIB, MVA, um, extended health coverage, uh, or self-pay. It's an integrated uh, initial assessment, and you leave with, A, a really great uh, consult letter for your family physician so they can supervise and monitor as needed. 
a set of recommendations on what additional things you should be doing to manage your concussion and potentially recommendations about additional treatments you need. Uh, and we are vigilant if you're good to go, giving you the green light, uh, get back to your life. Or if you need a small number of things, you might need a physio session to deal with neck issues, or um, you might need an occupational therapy session to do a more detailed plan uh, for school or work accommodations. Um, but our objective really is to get people back as quickly and safely as possible with specifically the right things in the right amounts and get them on the other side of this. Excellent. Remind us that website, please www.360concussioncare.com. www.360concussioncare.com. Sounds like a, a resource that uh, a lot of parents with uh, kids that are out skiing or playing sports or doing whatever should think about. I, uh, I've had several concussions. Um, the most recent one, uh, I, was at, uh, I was at a gym and uh, I just stood up into uh, the locker door above uh, my head. Um, and crashed down on the ground. Um, uh, I didn't go out, which was uh, good. Uh, got rushed to the hospital and uh, had really good care uh, right away. But that's when I was, uh, for the first time, uh, described uh, this new protocol about uh, you know getting back out there and not uh, not necessarily going into the to the dark room for uh, two or two weeks or whatever it was. Anyway, we're going to take a break uh, and come back with uh, Alex Johnson, CEO of ConcussionCareInc.com, uh, and um, and talk a little bit about infertility. Because that's another fascinating uh, conversation. And uh, she's an author of a book on this topic. Stay with us, everyone. We'll be back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone, to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. We've had a really interesting conversation with uh, Alex Johnston, who is the Chief Executive Officer at 360 Concussion Care, Inc., about concussions. But uh, Alex has written a book about her, uh, her journey, uh, from uh, infertility to mother motherhood. And, uh, uh, you know, I think this is really another very interesting topic. Alex, uh, tell us, uh, remind us what the what the title of the book is, please. Uh, Inconceivable, My Life-Altering, Eye-Opening Journey from Infertility to Motherhood. Eye-opening, inconceivable. Sounds like quite the journey. Tell us a little bit about, you know, number one, the motivation to write the book, and number two, what you describe. Uh, so motivation was, it was a, a truly, uh, it, there's no word to describe it. Uh, it was a very, very difficult experience building our family. Um, and very unlike what I expected walking into the situation, um, wrote it because I felt, uh, that we experienced something that I would not want other people, including other women like myself to experience, and that there are some very easy lessons learned uh, that could be implemented that would make a very significant difference for people. Um, my husband and I walked into starting our family at 32. I was full of piss and vinegar, pretty excited about the whole process. Like we were ready to become parents and you know, 32 felt pretty young for me. Um, I didn't feel ready, ready, but I was like, there's no better time than the present and you know, don't wait too long and, and get on with it. Um, and we got the traditional advice at my age, which was try for 12 months, no reason to believe there will be an issue, you're healthy. Um, if there was ever an issue, we would refer you on to a specialist, but that's not um, likely to happen. Uh, we tried for 12 months and nothing happened. So I was referred to a specialist, it takes time to get in. Um, and the first time I learned anything about my body and my fertility, I was 34 by then, we had spent about a year and a half waiting and waiting. Uh, and she did a fertility workup and she came back and said, your fertility, fertility is terrible. Um, like you have almost no eggs left. Um, this is going to be hard for you. And I said, but Dr. Weisberg, I'm 34 years old. And she said, Alex, at 34, 20% of you are going to face this. And I said, how am I having this conversation for the first time in the you know, waiting area of my fertility clinic, getting this game changing information that was as easy as anything to get? Um, and she said, I don't know. And that set us on a really difficult path. I said to her, what, if I was your daughter, what would you advise me? And she said, you got to get onto this immediately. You got to be super aggressive. And she said, if you want to have a chance of having a child, then you're going to need to go to IVF right away, which we did. And that didn't work. Um, and we ended Sorry, up, excuse me for a second. What's IVF? In vitro fertilization. So it's like what we used to refer to as the test tube baby. So it's, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, creating an embryo in uh, um, in a petri dish and then uh, sort of incubating it before you um, uh, carry it. Um, so I and why why would that work? 
I just couldn't carry whatever happened. We always, when I finally eventually got pregnant with my son many years later, I said like, I don't know why the embryo that stuck around. It was like a ghost town in there. Like nothing would stick around. And you're like, no, no, sign me up. I'm going to stay. Um, but I just couldn't get pregnant. Nothing would happen. So, um, so whatever. You fertilize the egg in the test tube uh, and, uh, and, and insert it uh, back in your body and it still wouldn't uh, work? No, nope, no. Nope. And uh, never registered a pregnancy. And so we ended up... Um, we ended up, uh, my youngest sister, who was doing her PhD at the time, I, I tried to act as an egg donor. So we tried to um, use her eggs and see if that would make a difference. And I never got pregnant. And then we ended up uh, working with a surrogate. And at the time, it was fairly unusual. Like you heard about it a little bit. I think Phoebe on Friends around that time uh, was a character who was carrying his her brother's uh, babies and she was having triplets. And that was kind of the only storyline about surrogacy. Um but we found um, a surrogate and she got pregnant uh, right away. Uh, and it felt thrilling, like three and a half years into this journey, we were getting ready to become parents. Um, and the day she went into labor, we went up to um, the Barry Hospital and uh, the baby died in labor and delivery. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. And that, that was, uh, you know, it really set us on a very different path. Um, and so we made the commitment together that, uh, we were going to grieve um, the loss of our daughter, Sam, uh, and we were going to try to become parents again. So we went through many, many different things um, uh, and ended up with two daughters who are um, three months apart, uh, two different surrogates. One of them was born uh, 11 weeks early, so it was in the NICU for quite a long time at St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto. And then very unexpectedly, when they were three months and six months old, I got pregnant with my son. <laughs> So he was 12 months younger than uh, one of the daughters. So we ended up with three kids in 15 months. Oh my God. Um, maybe this is too intrusive a question. I apologize, but how could you possibly get pregnant with your son after all of those experiences? And you must've been in your late thirties by the time. Yes. And Brian, there's almost no question for me that is too intrusive. Uh, he, it was a shock. It was like truly a shock. And the thing I read about this in the book, I found it hard because people would say, I guess he finally relaxed. I'm like, have you lost your mind? Like the implication then is that I was so uptight. I couldn't get pregnant. We have two little girls in our home, three months and six months. Life was absolute mayhem. Um, there was nothing about it that was relaxing. Uh, and we, I very unexpectedly got pregnant. And you were um, probably working in the premier's office at the time. You know what? When my son was born, I went back after three months. But when my daughters were born, I was out for nine months. Um, and uh, but I do think there was a physiological change. Like I did not carry the girls, but there's no question when you bring a baby home, something, you know, physiological was happening to my body. And that was the one and only time I got pregnant. Now, um, surrogacy, tell me about that experience. How, how, do, how do you find one? And uh, like, like um, how does that all work? Uh, so, so different now. Um, uh, back in the day, it was harder. So there were a few people who could sort of do a bit of surrogacy finding and matching. Um, there were a couple uh, small groups in Canada doing it, Ontario. Um, we found ours through someone who knew a couple who had worked with our first surrogate. Um, very different today. Uh, it's like, you know, fairly regulated. Um, we worked with a surrogate in the U.S., Green Bay, Wisconsin, and we're Green Bay Packers fans. Um, and then one in Owen Sound, Ontario. And uh, both experiences were like outstanding individuals, different. Like in the U.S., it's more a negotiated contract, uh, which I loved. Um, I had huge respect for our surrogate in the U.S. Her daughter actually is just going to carry for a couple that I introduced her to. Um, so her daughter's in her early 20s, has had a child. And so I reached out to my surrogate and said, Diane, would, do you know anyone who would want to do this? And Diane tried to carry many times for people we referred to her, but she was at that point too old. Um, so her daughter's going to do this, which is uh, exciting. Um, but, you know, legal contract, um, typically now to find a surrogate, you can try to use a network of people. And there's lots of online uh, guidance and forums. Um, and then there are surrogacy matchers, for lack of a better word, in Canada. Um, this is big business in the U S and in the U S it's hard because you're paying, you know, an agency 30, 40,000 to find someone, then you're paying a surrogate, um, a fee to do this. You're paying significant, uh, costs in, uh, medical fees. And, you know, you're looking at a hundred, $150,000, which is obviously not, um, manageable for most people. Canada is a bit different, but finding someone through an agency, uh, 
it costs some money, but there's a, you know, there's a, a network of women who are wonderfully prepared to do this. Um, and there are people who can help connect you to that person. Sounds like you still have a relationship with uh, the people that carried your daughters. Yeah, it's a very unusual experience to go through with someone. And it, like any relationship that really matters, a business relationship, a personal relationship, I entered it saying, I have to make these work. Um, both tremendously good people I worked with. And, and really, I felt not just the you know practicality of it, which I valued, but the care for us and the desire for us to become parents. Um, yeah, I mean, both of them are... Um, our exceptional people, uh, our surrogate uh, in Green Bay, um, uh, you know, I've sent both of them uh, pictures and um, always want to make sure that they are, um, you know, life is going well. Uh, but it's been fun with our Green Bay surrogate sort of going through this a little bit back and forth uh, for her daughter. We had a call about three days ago um, and I was just curious how her daughter's feeling. And I just, she texted me to say, it's solidified, she's going to do it early March. Um, and she role modeled incredible things for her daughter in what this experience was like. So I really love that. Now, please uh, explain to everyone if you could. Uh, so uh, are you still doing the, the Petri dish and then implanting the embryo? Or, excuse me. How does that all work? Yep. Yep. And uh, I'm laughing, Brian, because when I was at work, uh, I loved working for the premier. He was a wonderful man and a lawyer, but I forgot he had done his undergrad in science. And so he really wanted details. And I remember one point going, oh my God, this is like, giving my dad a sex talk. It was like, and then this happens and then this happens. So yeah, I mean, you extract eggs from the woman, sperm from the man, um, put them together uh, to create an embryo in a Petri dish. They really look at them now and they try to grow them for, you know, five, 10 days uh, to see what survives and uh, whatever survives, uh, they will either freeze or use. And then you're reinserting into another person's uterus, one embryo, two embryos, um, and then hoping that uh, the person achieves a pregnancy. Unbelievable uh, modern science. Um, I understand that there there are a limited number of eggs, but an unlimited number of sperm almost. Tell me about that, if you could. Um, you know, I don't know uh, on the sperm side. There are for sure a limited number of eggs. And so, you know, it's amazing when you see the stats of like, you know, by the time you're having babies, you shed 90% of your eggs. Um what happens and i was in this situation like someone is going to be on the fast end and someone's going to be on the slow end so when you hear about a woman having a baby at 42 you know her eggs just depleted you know more slowly i was on the super fast end and mine depleted really quickly and so when i started at 32 i had almost nothing left um the big difference and the reason my book focuses primarily on women even though this is 100 percent an issue that affects men and women Fertility declines for men and women, but it's declining for women right at the time that men and women want to have babies. It's declining for men 10 or 15 years later. So if we were having babies at 45, this would be a much bigger issue for men. Um, generally, most people are having babies in the early to mid 30s. Um, and so that window is right when your fertility as a woman peaks at 28. The average woman is not having a baby at 28, she's having a baby after 30. Sorry, uh, what? say that again. The average fertility, sorry, fertility peaks at 28? Yes, yeah. So you as a woman, your fertility peaks at 28. And so when we were having babies at 26, this was not an issue. It got to 28, 29, 30. The average age of pregnancy in Canada now is 31. And that's like Singapore, France, Germany. I mean, that's across the world. And so if that is the case, we've now got to accept that Men and women are having babies later. It's not just women. Men and women are choosing to have babies in their early to mid 30s. Um, predominantly, there's a lot of changes that have to go along with that. Shouting at them saying, no, no, you have to have kids at 25 is not going to work. So, well, and I, I interviewed someone that said that um, that people were having uh, starting menstruation like uh, two years earlier than uh, than than uh, than what had happened uh, a generation ago because of whatever hormones, uh, food, whatever. So maybe in fact that uh, peak is is getting younger maybe and i just you know i only know what i know and so when i realized it was 28 and i realized at 32 the advice i got was oh my god don't worry you're healthy like try for 12 months what they should have said to me at 28 is let's start tracking your fertility in the book i say every woman should get her fertility workup done if you're not ready to have a child after 28 just start doing it annually it costs nothing in canada it's covered by ohip or private health uh, public health care it's about $200 for the system. It's a blood, blood test and a scan of your ovaries. Um, make sure you have your information and you track it. Um, employers make sure fertility benefits for 
you know, medium sized to large companies are part of your benefits package. This is hugely important to your younger employees um, and governments shouting at people to have babies at 27 is not going to work. Uh, men and women have many things they're doing to get to a point where they feel like they've got the life stability, the relationship stability and financial stability to become parents. Um, we're going to have to adapt to that. And uh, this affects every young man, every young woman. And given the stats now, if you're starting in your early 30s, 15 to 20 percent between you know 32 and 34 are going to be going through this. What's the book called? How can I get it? <laughs> Inconceivable, my life altering, eye opening journey from infertility to motherhood. And available. Uh, yeah, for sure. Indigo Chapters is where I'd recommend your local bookstore um, and Amazon. And I understand you got um, picked as Heather's pick recently. Yes, I did. I was very happy. She's been a real champion of this issue, and she's a big champion of uh, of health issues, preventative health issues, um, and she's been a real champion of this. I have some kids in uh, in their uh, early 30s. I think um, I'm going to have to be telling them to go get a fertility workup. I think that's great advice. I really do, Brian. I think it's very proactive. Stay with us. We're going to take a break uh, for some messages and come back with some concluding comments and maybe touch on uh, on on uh, women in the workforce. Uh, stay with us, everybody. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, having a really interesting conversation tonight with uh, Alex Johnston, who is CEO of uh, Concussion Care Inc., a uh, uh, a clinic and a website and, a, and an organization that's trying to uh, really get uh, protocols for concussion out there, new protocols for concussion out there in the workplace. She's also written a book about infertility that uh, and surrogacy and uh, and her journey that sounds absolutely fascinating uh, and is encouraging everyone to uh, go out and get their uh, their um, their fertility workup if they're in their uh, their thirties and and be mindful of that because we're delaying the pregnancy I guess uh, longer than than uh, than we have in the past. But the other issue that I'd really like to chat about if we could is um, is women in the workplace uh, and your uh, time with Catalyst and, and and how you think it's changed. What What's the cause of this? Is this sexism? Is this, like what causes the situation where women haven't been, as you say, you did the survey of MBAs and they were offered lower jobs and lower money. What What's causing this? Is this Sheryl Sandberg that, uh, you know, we're not leaning in or like, what is it? Uh, so I think a few things. One, for sure, there are structures that were put in place that are hard to change. Um, and I think that structural piece is real. And I know some people have kind of a visceral reaction, like, don't tell me about structural this, structural that. Um, but structures were built by a group of people that don't work for everyone. Um, so looking at that matters. I think the second piece is, I don't think, like, you see almost very little over anything in the workplace. I think people know what they know is one. And two, when you ask people to change, it's really hard. It's hard for us to change any part of our life. Like we knew seatbelts were really important. We still didn't use them. We know smoking was terrible. It took decades, even with the evidence for people to be like, okay, maybe it's not so good for me. Um, and then really go at the next generation and make sure they're not starting. So they're not having to stop. It takes a lot of time. The important thing really is to keep drilling home on facts and evidence. Um, I think you're going to find very few people in the workplace who are uh, who are deliberately trying to stop people and block people. Um, I think supporting them and making them feel like this is not about them. You're bad. You're not doing it right. You're a terrible manager. Um, I always want to say, make people feel comfortable in having these discussions. Don't don't frighten them about the words they use and the language if it's imperfect. Like if the intent is right and if they're really doing the right things and they're understanding the problem and the solutions, empower them to actually be a part of the solution. An amazing CEO on our board, Lorraine Mitchellmore, who is the global EVP for heavy oil for Shell in the Canada country head. Lorraine used to say, there's a cement middle in the middle of companies and it's people who aren't able to really enact change. It's that middle management group. And she said, it's not just lack of willingness, empower them, support them, inform them, make them feel like they're a part of this. Not like you're going to lose a job once we get a whole bunch of you know diverse candidates through the pipeline and you're out of here. If you approach it like that, no one's going to row in the same direction. So make people feel like this is about the best, strongest possible company, using your talent and your team really well, making sure you understand if there are obstacles for that happening for women uh, and for um, diverse candidates, and then be an architect of change. Um, and people want to be that. Uh, they just don't want to feel like they're going to be pushed out. And there's a big pie for a lot of people in the workplace um, and make sure that people see growth as something connected to them, not just as we grow and we move people through your yesterday's news, 
Um, all these things are really important. So I don't think it's one thing. I do not think women are a big part of the problem. I think all the, you know, headlines about like, speak up and raise your hand and ask. We saw over and over in our research, women were not being given the same big projects as men to be able to get the visibility, the experience to position themselves for the next big job. And people be like, she's not quite ready. He's ready. She's not quite ready. There's a lot of stuff that goes into um, how your career unfolds that has nothing to do with you just not being able to you know, raise your hand or speak up assertively. I don't think that's a big part of the problem. I really do think the structural barriers and then lack of understanding of what those obstacles are is the two things we need to focus on. So, you know, it's interesting that you focus on structure barriers. I thought it was sexism. It was personal attitudes that was the, <laughs> excuse me, the challenge. You say it's not personal attitudes. It's something different. I don't think there's a lot of deliberate uh, holding people back, Brian. I really don't. And I don't think the evidence supports that. I do think that people know what they know. And if you've worked in a certain way for a long period of time and it works for you, why change? And so it's not deliberately saying, I don't think this person, I don't think that person. I do think there's lots of attitudes that, you know, inform our decision making uh, that we have to look at. Uh, we are all susceptible to that. I am susceptible to that. I've had aha moments where I'm like, how did you go into that decision with that stereotype or that what's going on here. Um, but I do think that, uh, I do think that a lot of it is simply making sure people have the information, clear evidence on what the barriers are, and then a real push and objectives and goals to address those barriers. So you are doing as much as you need to be doing with your talent. Alex Johnson, thank you so much for joining us tonight and talking to us about concussion, about infertility, and about women in the workplace. Really appreciate it. You are an outstanding interviewer. That's very kind of you. That's our show for tonight, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Good night.